Welcome to this latest Wednesday webinar on Creative Commons licenses. These are something which a lot of people will have heard of, but they might not be sure exactly what they are and how they're used. As with all things copyright, they're actually much simpler than they appear to be. The key is to think of the licenses a bit like instructions in a cookbook. You can put anything together as long as you start off with the right ingredients. You might notice some foodie themes as we go through this webinar, so you might want to grab some snacks before we start. In this webinar, we're going to introduce the licenses, talk a little bit about their history and development, break them down into their component parts, and think how they can be used by both those who create content and those who want to use that content. The first, and perhaps the most crucial ingredient in our cookbook, is a basic understanding of copyright. Copyright and Creative Commons are meant to work together rather than work against each other. So in talking about one, we need to make sure that we do have an understanding of the other. Copyright is an automatic legal right which is part of a larger suite of intellectual property rights. These rights and laws govern how the outputs of a creator, such as a journal article, book or a painting, can be used by others. Copyright law exists for a number of reasons. It offers an incentive to creators to encourage them to produce new works by giving them the chance to gain both money and a reputation from their work. And the laws also offer the creators a level of protection by helping to ensure that others don't claim credit for work that they produced. Copyright is automatically granted once an original work meeting the criteria on the screen has been produced in a fixed form. For example, typing up a book chapter. The work needs to be original and it needs to be in one of the seven key conditions that you see there on the screen. Copyright is divided into two main areas, economic rights and moral rights, and it's important to understand the difference between these in relation to Creative Commons. Economic rights are simply the right to make money from a work by producing copies or renting it out, creating a new version or an adaptation, or showing the work to the public. These rights belong to the original creator unless they're sold or given away. In contrast, the moral rights always stay with the creator and are designed to protect their reputation and give them the credit that they're due for producing the work in the first place. Although copyright law is designed to prevent certain actions, it's as much about helping to advance knowledge as it is anything else. It aims to promote the use of different materials in a lawful way that helps to protect the rights of content creators but still allow people to build on this content. People often think that copyright is all about what you can do wrong, but this really isn't the case. And this is where Creative Commons fits in. So now that we've all hopefully uh, gotten to grips with copyright, what exactly do you mean when we talk about Creative Commons? Creative Commons licenses are open licenses, which are designed to complement the existing copyright laws rather than to override them. Copyright is a historic protection, which was designed in a world where knowledge was shared in a certain way, usually by printing it and selling it, or learning it out through a library. As with everything else, as technology has developed, so has the way we share information, and it's become a lot easier for the creators of content to share their work online. This is great, but it often results in a conflict with copyright restrictions, as once something is online, it can be easily shared, and then it's really easy to lose track of who it belongs to, or what the copyright permissions are. The safest thing to do in these circumstances is to assume that it's under copyright and therefore people can't use it, but obviously in the real world this doesn't stop people using things which results in illegal use. On the flip side of this, you have people who would be happy with their content being used, but users or potential users are overly cautious about using something when they don't explicitly know whether they can. In a world where we're trying to promote and develop our collective knowledge, there surely has to be a better way. And this is where Creative Commons comes in. So the Creative Commons organisation was created to help address these tensions and also as a result of other copyright developments. In 1998, the US Copyright Term Extension Act extended the term of copyright for every work in the US by an extra 50 years so that it was brought into line with other countries where the default term of copyright in a work is the lifetime of the creator plus 70 years. 
After this, the work would pass into the public domain and people would be able to use it as they needed. Lawrence Lessig, who is a professor of law at Stanford University in the US, thought that this extension was unconstitutional, as it meant that works were kept out of the public domain for longer. He argued that this was actually stifling the very creativity that copyright was meant to help promote. The resulting court case that Lessig uh, brought before the court actually failed, but it did lead to the creation of both the Creative Commons organisation and the licences themselves. The licences were launched in 2002 as a way for creators to specify how they wanted their work to be used in a simple and easy to understand way that was consistent with copyright law. Attaching a Creative Commons license means that the creator retains the right to their work but allows them to clearly outline to others how they would like that work to be used. In theory, this simplifies the process of building on existing knowledge and creating new knowledge. The licenses themselves are regularly updated and the latest iteration, version 4.0, was launched in 2013. At this point, it's really important to reiterate that the licenses sit alongside copyright law and copyright exceptions, like using materials for educational purposes. They're simply designed to work with the existing rules to make things easier to understand. So getting back to our cookbook analogy, you need to know about the ingredients that you'll be using to create your recipe. So let's take a closer look at the elements of a Creative Commons license. Each license is made up of three layers, a little bit like a cake. At the base, you have the human readable plain language version of the license, the bit that makes it easy to understand for the rest of us. This is known as the common deed and is probably the part that most people will be familiar with. Next, there is the legal code. This is the legally enforceable part of the license which can be used in court if necessary. A lot of people assume that because these licenses can be so easily accessed online, that they don't actually mean anything, but they are actually legally enforceable licenses. Of course, the idea of them is to make sure things don't get that far, but on the odd occasion that they have, these licenses can and have been relied on as a defence. The final layer of the cake is the machine-readable layer, which is aimed at computer software and is easy for websites, apps and search engines to understand. This is something which helps them to index openly licensed content so that those looking for it can find it easily. So what about the individual elements of a license, the different ingredients that make up each one? You've probably seen at least some of the symbols on the screen, even if you're not sure what they all mean. The six main Creative Commons licenses are designed to be completely customizable according to which of the following four elements on the screen you include. Each license must acknowledge the creator of the work using the attribution element. This is only removed if the work is placed in the public domain with a CC0 license or the creator explicitly waives their right to attribution. The no derivatives element specifies that there can be no public changes made to the original work, including adaptations and remixes. This element is part of two of the main licenses. If a non-commercial element is included, then only the original creator is allowed to make money from their work. Anyone who uses the original as the basis of something new can't sell it or otherwise use it for commercial purposes like putting it on a t-shirt. Non-commercial is part of two of the main licenses. The final element is share alike. This specifies that any new creations made from existing materials must be shared under the same license as the original work. So for example, if the original work is under a non-commercial license, the new one must be too. The result is a license that's been explicitly made to order, a little bit like a burger at your favourite fast food restaurant. Each one is made up of the range of ingredients of the restaurant stocks, but these can be combined in different ways according to the customer preference. The only thing that each one has to include is some type of burger patty, which is the CC by element in this analogy. But you can include a variety of different toppings as you like. If the creator wants to make sure the work isn't used commercially, they can add cheese, which is the non-commercial element and then top it off with bacon, the share-alike element, 
to make sure that anyone adapting their work shares the new creation under the same license. The result is a Creative Commons license which can be applied to the work and outlines exactly what that creator wants others to do with that work. Different works by the same creator can be licensed in different ways depending on how they want it shared and the same is often true of different works from the same publisher. So don't assume because you've seen one license one way everything will be like that. There are six main Creative Commons licenses excluding CC0 which is something known as putting works into the public domain. This is something which happens after a certain period of time anyway when anyone is free to use the work as it's not restricted by copyright but creators can also attach a CC0 license to material which makes it available straight away. Although the licenses on the screen are visually quite similar you'll see that each one is made up of slightly different elements. They're arranged on the screen from least to most restrictive. Starting in the top left, attribution, those using these works are free to distribute, remix and build upon the original work as long as they credit the author of the original creation. And this is the text actually taken from the Creative Commons website. Moving down, next we have attribution share alike, where people are able to remix or build upon a work and use it commercially if they like, as long as they credit the original creator and share the work they create under the same license as the original. Next we have attribution non-commercial, where again people can adapt and remix a work, but they can't do so for commercial gain. Moving to the top of the second column, we have attribution no derivatives. The new work can be shared both commercially and non-commercially, as long as the work is unchanged and the original author is credited. It's worth remembering that, somewhat confusingly, people can change your work under this license for their own private use, but they're not allowed to share it in any way. Moving further on, we have attribution, non-commercial, share alike. Under this license, work can be remixed and built upon non-commercially, as long as the original creator is given credit and the new work is licensed under identical terms to the original. And finally, we have attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives which is the most restrictive of the open licenses. And this specifies that works can be downloaded and shared and used as long as they're not changed in any way, not used commercially, and the original creator is given credit. Unfortunately, the exact choice of license is not always up to the creator of the work. Different research funders and different publishers may mandate that outputs they're involved with have certain open licenses attached, and any creators should check the conditions of their funder or publisher really carefully to make sure that there isn't a conflict with the license they want to attach. When any recipe is complete, it's time to present the finished product to the wider world so that they can sample the new creation. But how do creators actually go about using Creative Commons licenses? In this next section, we're going to look at how you can go about licensing work for others to use and how you as a user can find and make use of openly licensed content. Although words like licensing and copyright make people think they're dealing with something complex, in practice it's really easy to license work under Creative Commons using three simple steps. The Creative Commons website has a handy license selector tool which will talk anyone wanting to use a Creative Commons license through the process of choosing the right one once this is done, the website lets you download a machine-readable code, licensing statements and images to add to any materials so that the correct license is always displayed. As long as the Creative Commons license is attached in some way, then the work is protected. But remember that Creative Commons licenses complement copyright law, and so they will be valid under the copyright in the, until the copyright in the work expires, but not beyond that. Step two is to add a statement to the work explaining that it's openly licensed, which license is attached, and the details of the creator. The wording that Creative Commons themselves recommend is the wording you see on the screen. It's important to mention the type of license you're attaching and the version number, as the rules vary slightly for each different one. It's best to use the latest version of the license you want, as this obviously has the most up-to-date rules, and it also goes without saying that if you want to be credited, then you need to include your name. The final step is something which a lot of people don't consider when assigning an open license, 
but it's important to think about how open you're really making that work. So adding an open license is a great step, but it isn't really of much use if there are other blocks to using the material that you're licensing. Creators need to consider using open formats rather than proprietary software so that more people can access the work and make sure they don't upload it to a platform which uses some type of digital rights management which can stop people from actually building on the work, locking it down. Once a Creative Commons license has been attached to a work, it can't be revoked, but there are some options open to creators if they decide they're not happy. They can take the work in question offline and or re-upload it with a different license, but they need to remember that there's no such thing as removing something completely from the internet. If someone has already found the work under its original license, then they're not breaking any rules to use it under that original license, no matter what the creator has decided later. For example, if the non-commercial element was added later and someone has found the work under the original license which allowed commercial use, there's not really much that the creator can do about it. Permanence is not the only consideration creators need to think about when licensing their work. Some types of format are just not appropriate for Creative Commons licenses, and the most common example of this is computer software, where there are other, more specific open licenses which can be applied. We need to think about whether the work is copyrightable in the first place. Creative Commons licenses can't be applied to any material that isn't already covered by copyright, such as works already in the public domain. Does the person applying the license actually have the right to do this? Do they own the copyright to the material they want to license? You can't apply open licenses to material you don't own the rights to or where the rights belong to someone else. Creators also need to think carefully about which parts of a larger work they're applying a license to. If a work takes existing text belonging to someone else and adds new images, then the license can only be applied to the new elements and any statement needs to make this completely clear. We'll cover this in more detail when we talk about using Creative Commons content later on in the webinar. So we've thought about the chef in our cookbook analogy, but what about the person sampling the finished dish? How do potential users go about finding and using Creative Commons licensed content? A quick online search will bring up a huge range of open content, but even when using filters, it pays to be cautious and always double check the license on the individual work you want to use. There are dedicated search engines and sites which only offer open content such as the Creative Commons search tool at Wikimedia Commons, which you might want to either use or direct people looking for open content to. Once you've found the material, it's important that it's properly attributed. There are many ways of citing this material, and there might be local conventions, but one of the best is the tassel method. Title, author, source, and license. For example, the attribution for this webinar would be Creating the Perfect Recipe, the Creative Commons Cookbook by Claire Saul, Office of Scholarly Communication, Cambridge, is licensed under a CC BY 4.0 license. This includes all of the relevant information so that others can locate and correctly attribute the work if needed. You could use material that is already registered as CC0. This is material not under a license, but instead in the public domain. This means the material is free to use and build upon without attribution. Although if you know the details of the creator, then it's still quite good practice to attribute them. Finally, it's a good idea to remember that Creative Commons licenses are designed as a way to complement copyright, not replace it. If your intended use of material falls under any existing copyright exceptions or limitations, then this overrides the CC license. One of the major sources of confusion around using Creative Commons license content comes when someone is collecting it together or remixing it to create something new, something which is fundamental to the principle of openly licensed material. A collection and a remix are two different things, and this foodie example by Nate Angel helps to illustrate the key difference. So in the left-hand side, in the collection, separately licensed works can be gathered together 
For example, a collection of openly licensed poetry can be brought together to create a new one whole resource. Each work is separately licensed, and even when brought together, each piece retains its own individual identity. Like the TV dinner you see on the screen, the meat doesn't mix with the peas and the potato doesn't touch the gravy. The license of each individual element remains, and these have to be clearly indicated. Although the collection as a whole might be subject to copyright, this is only in any new contributions which have been made in collecting it together, such as the arrangement of work or any additional content like an introduction. By contrast, a remix is more like the fruit smoothie you see on the right. Individual works with their own open license are brought together and then mixed up to create something completely new, like the fruit in your breakfast drink. It's impossible to tell where one ingredient ends and another begins, so creating a remix usually results in a work which is original enough to qualify for copyright protection in its own right, but unfortunately it's not always that clear cut. Another complication is the rules around which licenses are compatible. There's a handy table available on the Creative Commons website and I recommend looking at this to make sure the materials you want to use can in fact be remixed. So it would be great if everyone followed the rules in the recipe, but unfortunately sometimes things go wrong and you can end up with the dreaded soggy bottom. Many content creators who would like to use open licensing are worried about how it will impact the use of their work and how they can ensure that people observe the rules they've set out via a certain license. Unfortunately, it's just a sort of fact of sharing things that they won't be able to protect us at all times. Once something is online, there's only so much that can be done. However, there are some reassurances that we can offer people who are worried. Creators can choose not to be associated with their materials, or they can object to any use of their materials which they strongly disagree with. Although attribution is a fundamental ingredient in all Creative Commons licenses, creators can completely waive their right to attribution when releasing it publicly. In addition, if they don't like how their creation has been used or adapted, they can ask to have their name removed from that particular version. The underlying text of the attribution element also contains a clause which stops the name of the original creator being used to endorse or support the views expressed in the new work. If this happens, an official objection can be raised citing the legal clause within each license. This is particularly important to explain to researchers in the arts and humanities who have raised really specific concerns around the potential for their words to be twisted if their work is openly licensed. Creative Commons licenses are legal documents which can, and have been, used to protect the rights of contact, content creators in court. They contain specific protections which help to secure these rights at the same time as helping content creators promote the use of their outputs more widely. On the flip side of this, creators need to remember that as long as licensees, the people using the material, are not violating the license in any way, the creators have a limited amount of control once something has been published. This is one of the reasons why knowing about the different licenses and spending time choosing the right one is so important for those who are producing content. Anyone using Creative Commons licenses, either as a licensor or as a licensee, should remember that these are legally enforceable licenses which will stand up as a court offence. Broadly speaking, the open community follows the rules, but there have been a few cases involving Creative Commons licensed material which have gone to court, and the legitimacy of the licenses has never been in question. Those who violate the license have their rights terminated, although under the most recent version they have up to 30 days to correct any violation, which takes care of most things which are genuine mistakes. Hopefully the result of the Creative Commons cookbook is a simple and effective way to promote the sharing and reuse of the world's knowledge. These licenses offer creators the chance to specify what they will allow others to do with their work, whilst protecting their rights and at the same time those looking to use material have an easy way to understand how they can use what they find. Like all the best recipes, let's hope the cookbook is used for years to come. The more people who use Creative Commons licenses, the more material will be available and who knows where this knowledge could lead. Thanks for watching our latest Wednesday webinar.